Chapter 1. Gifts, Healing, and Serving Others When I was younger, I rarely felt comfortable in my skin. I always felt stressed out, hopeless, stuck, sad, and different from everyone else. I turned to popular self-improvement tools, hoping they'd point me the way to inner peace and prosperity. But my efforts came out flat. I recited affirmations, dissected and revised my limiting beliefs, read tons of self-help books, and went to therapy. Yet no matter how much I did the work, my life either stalled or got worse. It wasn't until I learned about the energy in and around our bodies and how keeping this energy cleansed can unveil and sharpen our spiritual gifts and purpose in life that everything changed. Big time. Turns out that taking care of your energetic body is as essential as caring for your physical, mental, and emotional selves. No matter what your background or religious beliefs, energy affects you deeper than you can imagine. The key to happiness, peace, and fulfillment then is purifying and mastering your energetic body. As soon as I learned to do this, life began working for me rather than against me. I became more confident, vibrant, loved, and at one with God. I felt like the person that I always knew I was and tried so hard to share with others. I now attracted incredible friends, partners, business prospects, and a lifestyle that I felt I deserved, while toxic people and opportunities fell away. Acceptance, abundance, and success were no longer dreams, but a daily reality. Achieving the impossible became not only inevitable, but a daily lifestyle. Miracles and blessings now show up so often that strangers who watch it play out joke that a day in my life feels like a movie, but it's all become normal to me. It's been nearly 20 years since I first discovered the extraordinary power that comes with understanding, detoxing, and using energy to create a life I never dreamed was possible. This kind of joy, abundance, and clarity are your soul's natural way of operating too. Let me explain how I got here so you can recognize or our stories converge and with this book, experience the universe's magic for yourself. A spiritual head start. I'm originally from the city of Manila, which is the capital of the Philippines. If you've never been, I like to compare my hometown to New York City, an urban playground full of skyscrapers, tourists, and a diverse class system. I lived there until I graduated high school. At the time, most of the locals spoke English, including my family. I think the best reflection of the city's population might actually be its restaurants. Chinese, Italian, Japanese, French, Middle Eastern, you name it. Outside the city, the general landscape is more provincial and underdeveloped. It reminds me of the Texas or Arizona countryside where you can drive for miles and see nothing but cows and farmland. Catholicism was and still is the predominant belief system in the Philippines, so it's no surprise that I grew up in a fierce Catholic family. The funny thing about Filipino culture, though, is that it's big on superstition too. So like many Filipinos, my family leaned into the spiritual practices that weren't religious whenever it suited us. When we'd move to a new home, my parents would hire an albulario to bless the land. He might also be called if a family member was sick with a tough illness or in an unshakable dark mood. The word albulario translates to medicine man, folk healer, or witch doctor. As kids, my friends and I also wore agimats, amulets or charms made of brass, copper, wood, or bone, which are related to Filipino magic and sorcery. We believed the threaded talismans brought us good luck and kept us safe with their mystical powers. So on the other hand, 
out of the box spiritual practices were considered taboo, but on the other, they were embedded in our culture. You can imagine how this sent mixed messages as a child, even though mystical contradictions exist in most cultures. It's like how old school Italians can strictly practice Catholicism, which condemns supernatural beliefs, but might wear a cornicello, which is Italian for horn around their neck to protect them from the evil eye. Not only did my family lean in to these cultural practices when the spirit moved them, but they possessed innate supernatural gifts that some of my friends' families didn't. When I was young, my paternal grandfather, who we called Lolo, often channeled the souls of dead relatives, but only when he felt it was necessary. When my family fought over a land inheritance, Lolo channeled his deceased father to settle the rivalry. Lolo also called on deceased family members for heavenly advice and insight to solve health concerns. When he channeled, his head would fall back, his voice would get deeper and slower, and his mannerisms would look just like the souls that he conjured. If, as a human, the soul was tall, Lolo would pull his shoulders back to make himself appear larger than life. Or, if it had a limp or a lisp while alive, he'd mimic that too. The soul would then say its name and deliver the message. It was scary and fascinating at the same time. My parents also demonstrated gifts, so these sorts of abilities ran on both sides of my family. My father spoke in tongues, which he felt was an acceptable and blessed gift from the Holy Spirit, though I now view his gift as him channeling energy by using his tongue to communicate its sound frequency. Meanwhile, my mother dreamed warnings, mostly about family members' accidents, deaths, or unfaithful spouses, and her dreams all come true. Once, she dreamed that my cousin's fiancé got into a freak car accident. Two weeks later, his car was tragically hit and he flew through the windshield and died. And then, every once in a while, we'd experience spiritual phenomena and startling interactions with the mythical beings. Once, during the anniversary of my maternal grandmother's death, all my family members smelled her strong perfume no matter where we stood in the room. We could also smell her favorite flower, the distinctly sweet and fragrant Sampaguita, the national flower of the Philippines. Similar to how the Irish have leprechauns and Icelanders have elves, in Filipino folklore, there is the capre. The capre isn't cute and playful. It looks like a giant gnarled tree and is typically tall, dark, hairy, and very muscular. Capres are also believed to smoke cigars and have strong, terrible body odor. They like to play pranks on people or befriend women they find attractive. When my sister Pia was seven years old, she swore she heard a capres deep laugh and voice beckon to her. She immediately ran away screaming. When she told the adults, everyone believed her and then shared their own stories about capre sightings. This might sound like it made for fascinating barbecues or family reunions, but there was still a lot of fear and shame around believing in spiritual oddities that weren't condoned by Catholicism. Even so, they piqued my curiosity, especially when, around the age of seven, I began to have my own curious encounters. For one, I sensed things that my friends and classmates didn't. I instinctively knew what people around me thought and felt, picked up on the presence of spirits in the room, and saw silhouettes of angels and other light beings. I'd feel goosebumps, my heart would race, and then I'd suddenly feel a tug between fear and fascination. Fright typically won out whenever this occurred, so I learned to shut my spiritual abilities down by ignoring my sixth sense and staying busy with school. I also prayed a lot. When I wasn't smoking cigarettes and swigging from a bottle of Lambanog, a Filipino hard liquor, drinking numbed me out enough to take the edge off and weaken my spiritual antenna. 
which I now know is because it dims the chakras and the third eye. As time went on, I became increasingly reclusive and didn't fit in with most of the kids at school because I didn't feel normal. I worried that others could sense that something was different about me. I became an outcast who was often bullied and forced to eat my lunch in the boys' bathroom. I'd find an empty stall, lock the door, sit on the toilet lid, and lift my feet up so nobody would know I was there. Had I known my gifts were a blessing, that I could control them, perhaps I would have felt less terrorized and ashamed. Looking back, I would have given anything for a guide of some kind to provide context to what I was experiencing. Someone who could tell me that these traits made me special, not strange. I'd like to think I would have used my gifts to understand other kids around me on a deeper level and help them understand me too. New country, new me. When I was 18 years old, my family moved to the United States. In the Philippines, my mother was an established pediatrician, while my father wore a lot of hats, surgeon, dentist, real estate mogul, and soldier in the Philippine army. Before our move, though my father focused mostly on being a businessman, he grew many different kinds of rice and sold them in large barrels at our local market in in over a dozen cities. Though his business did well for a while, it eventually fell on hard times and our family accumulated a lot of untenable debt. That's when my parents decided to move us from Manila to Lakewood, California for a fresh start. Both of my parents became nurses and worked hard to offer me and my siblings a better education and more opportunities than they felt would have access to at home. Just before we moved, I was learning how to fit in by becoming a musician. I played guitar in a band and wrote a lot of moody, romantic songs. It was a safe outlet for me since musicians are usually popular. So it scored me friends and even my first girlfriend. But in Lakewood, I was a stranger in a strange land and had a hard time adjusting. I had no friends and couldn't relate to the culture. I decided that I had no choice but to use the move as an opportunity to reinvent my identity. I also badly needed money. So I launched an online business that specialized in relationship and dating advice for men. I was good at giving advice to the guys in the band, thanks to the fact that I have four sisters, and around the same time, the movie Hitch with Mill Smith had come out. So offering romantic tips from a guy's perspective was in the zeitgeist. I taught seminars and workshops, published eBooks, sold digital programs, and did all the company's marketing. Running this site helped me meet a few new friends and feel less lonely. At the same time, I dug into self-development books and growth work. I listened to CDs, went to workshops, read self-help books like Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich, Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People, and Earl Nightingale's The Strangest Secret. I tried hard not to feel as lost as I did as a kid in Manila. About two years later, I talked to my coworker Jeff about everything I'd learned in the self-help arena and how I'd been trying to apply it to the business, but I wasn't too sure if it was helping. He suggested I connect with a psychic named Crystal who could offer some spiritual guidance and supernatural insight about my goals. I was desperate to do anything I could to find happiness and success. A little mysticism couldn't hurt. And in fact, it spoke to the Filipino side of me that was raised in a culture that welcomed the occasional spiritual intervention. During my reading, Crystal zeroed in on energy blocks in my chakras and auric field, which is an energetic halo that extends 18 inches or more around everyone's bodies. She said these blocks were stopping me from reaching financial and emotional abundance. And then drew me a picture of where they lived relatively to my energetic body. Crystal also talked to me about chakras, which she said are spinning disks of energy that refer to energy points in the body 
and correspond to bundles of nerves, major organs, and areas that affect our emotional and physical well-being. This is the first time anyone had talked to me about energy, much less how it related to social and financial fulfillment. It felt like I'd been handed a secret, magical key, and I planned to use it to open as many doors as I could. When I left Crystal, I felt newly hopeful and excited for the future. And if working on my energy was a super highway to happiness, money, and fulfillment, I was eager to learn as much as I could. Crystal then told me about a healer named Nick who could sense and remove my blocks, which would help me become the best and most productive version of myself. I couldn't book that appointment fast enough. When I met Nick, I was fascinated by and drawn to his new age vibe. He lived in a guest house in Malibu on Topanga Canyon. The house itself was shaped like an octagon, which I've since learned is a spiritual symbol for rebirth and eternal life. In Nick's sacred space, posters of deities like Ganesh and Amma, who is referred to as the hugging saint, hung on his walls. Meditative music and the smell of newly burned sage filled the room. Nick was very tall, dressed in all white with mala beads around his neck, in his mid-thirties and had an Australian accent, though he barely spoke. He simply pointed to a chair for me to sit in and asked me to close my eyes as he waved a smoky quartz crystal around my body and made whooshing sounds with his mouth. Though my eyes were shut, I peeked sometimes to see him use various crystals to remove the blocks that he said had been holding me back for so long. Our 40-minute session felt relaxing, but I didn't feel much other than calm and open to more spiritual experiences. At the end, Nick said a great opportunity would bring me abundance in three to five weeks. I crossed my fingers and looked out for sudden good fortune. Spiritual Awakenings About a month later, I got a call to participate in an opportunity that would make me more in one day than I could in over a year, and I instantly attributed it to Nick's healing. I couldn't explain it otherwise. I was asked to speak at a conference packed with thousands of guests eager to buy a program that I created to help them grow their company's social media following. I hadn't done anything different in my life or career to welcome this invite other than to see Nick. So I trusted that his clearing removed enough blocks from my field to allow abundance to flow from the universe. Unfortunately, because I'd never made this much money in my life, much less in one shot, I was irresponsible and lost most of the cash. And soon, I was right back to where I began. Despite that, I wanted to forge a new path for myself and couldn't look away from the miracle I'd experienced. And with such minimal effort, I intuitively knew I needed to know more about how Nick's abilities work so I could use them on myself. We kept in touch and became friends as I picked his brain about chakras, healing, and energy. Between Crystal and Nick, I learned a lot of the basics involved in healing work, details about grounding, protection, energetic cords, invisible cords that connect you to others through thought, emotions, feelings, and physical sensations, auras, chakras, and of course, energetic blocks. I still use and teach a lot of these tools today, and I'll get into them much deeper later in this book. Once I exhausted my mentor's knowledge, I remained hungry to learn more and determined to understand as much as I could. It's like the old saying, give a man a fish and he will eat for a day. Teach a man to fish and he will eat for a lifetime. I craved a lifetime of good fortune and spiritual alignment that flowed freely from energy healings. I couldn't help but suspect that the universe had dangled a carrot in front of me by guiding me to these two spiritual teachers who seemed to hold the keys to success. As my gut said, I could do this work on my own. I was in search of life-changing tools that would help to improve my work and guide my spiritual journey. So Crystal recommended I travel to Sedona, which she said was the hub 
of spiritual growth and enlightenment. She said it was a magical, mystical city, one where I could learn, grow, and unblock even more energetic impediments. While in Sedona, I hired a shaman tour guide at Crystal Suggestion, which became the highlight of my trip. This man really knew the spiritual lay of the land. He took our group to the top of vortex points where tourists are said to have spiritual awakenings and explained that a vortex point is any point on earth that acts as a swirling center of earthly energy, containing more energy than other points in the world. The Great Pyramid of Egypt, Machu Picchu in Peru, and Stonehenge in England are other vortex points said to hold the same mystical power as those Arizona mountaintops. I climbed to the peak of a small vortex point, closed my eyes, and sat quietly. Almost immediately, I was overcome by a very strong energy that rose up from the earth and into my body. I was lightheaded and tingly throughout my whole being, and I felt myself emotionally crack open. My eyes flooded with tears as deeply traumatic experiences bubbled up to the surface of my mind and consciousness around abandonment, rejection, self-love, guilt, resentment, and anger. These were mostly from old wounds related to my family and upbringing. I harbored a lot of bitterness towards my parents for moving to the U.S. just as I was getting comfortable in Manila. I felt like the rug had been pulled out from underneath me. Because I felt so displaced in the new culture, I also dealt with feelings of inadequacy rooted in these childhood bullying days, plus not knowing how to succeed in circles so different from what I was used to. While on our vortex points, our guide said that if we felt overcome with painful emotions, we shouldn't fear them, but lovingly release them into the earth. The best way to do this was to notice these emotions without judgment and say, I'm releasing and letting go for the highest good of all. So when my burdens surface, I let them go. I also intuitively suspected that these were the root causes of even more energetic blockages that hadn't yet left my auric field and needed to be set free. I mentally imagined handing them to the earth, and since I was doing this on a vortex point, I believed it would be a swift and intense process. After I released these feelings, I pictured a cup of dirty water emptying out within myself that allowed me to make space for a newer, purer energy to come into my being. Once the cup was empty, I felt a strong jolt of energy pass through me. And that's when the visions started. Sacred geometry symbols appeared in my mind's eye out of nowhere, unfamiliar shapes and patterns flooded my thinking. And I'll be honest, I momentarily wondered if I was dehydrated from being out in the sun too long. Earlier that week, I had noticed a few locals wearing similar shapes on a necklace, scarf, or shirt, but I never realized that these were sacred geometries that held special meaning. After a half hour, I opened my eyes. The symbols disappeared, but they were replaced by the physical presentation of energy playing out before me. The energy looked like sparkles, almost like fireflies, and I could move my hand over and through them as if they were a hologram. I saw atoms split and spirals of light dance in the air. I believe I was witnessing an energetic realm that few can see. I instinctively knew that I had opened my third eye during this vortex point meditation and that my life was about to change. I believe those moments on the mountaintop initiated a clear connection to a higher power because the images and visions kept coming. It was like the universe had turned on the spiritual faucet and I couldn't shut it off, nor did I want to. As synchronicities go, I noticed sacred geometry symbols everywhere I went. As graffiti on the wall, on a poster at a store, or as a pattern on a rug. Before I left for Sedona, Nick told me that if I saw spiritual symbols that were out of the norm more than once and within a short period of time, then I had to pay attention to the message 
that might be surrounding them. Signs, he said, are the universe's way of communicating direction, guidance, and answers, and validation that you're on a spiritual path. From that point forward, I'd wake up at night with racing thoughts about sacred geometry. I saw and received even more downloads of information about people and situations that I didn't know what to do with. I wasn't sure if what I was experiencing was real or if my imagination had run wild. For instance, I dream about writing a letter to my father, which I trust was an instruction from God. So I'd wake up and do just that. I'd address all the feelings that I held inside and feel so much better. I'd also dream of situations before they happen, like the time I saw myself house hunting in a strange neighborhood. And then the next day, I found myself looking at homes in the same setting as my dream. I might also dream of a phrase, and a few days later, someone would say it. I dream about dates as well, and when I'd type them into Google, I'd learn that an otherworldly event had happened on that day. Perhaps a crop circle had been discovered. Collectively, these moments validated that a higher power was communicating with me and that I was being led down a special path. I reveled in my astonishing experiences and moved forward with faith and commitment. Honing my gifts. Four days after my trip to Sedona, I returned to Tucson where I was living and had an urge to do a healing on myself in a new way. Now, when I say healing, I'm referring to an energetic clearing of any remaining negative and traumatic blocks that might have been holding me back in my life. I am not referring to healing health issues, which I didn't even realize was possible and came later in my spiritual growth. Though I'd visited a healer and cleared blocks on the vortex point, sometimes our energy field requires multiple clearings to fully cleanse, like when we are very ill or at the start of our spiritual journeys. I had no real awareness of this at the time. Nobody had said as much, but I had a hunch that turned out to be true. I was also curious to find out if I could play with my energy, since others could read and manipulate it so well. So I began to experiment with energy healing on myself. First, I ran my hand over my body and felt heat, tingling, and a magnetic sensation in areas where I was still blocked. I then sensed what those blocks were connected to, what was causing them, and what would happen to me if I didn't fix them. To pull the block from my body, I gesture as if to scoop the area where I felt the toxins lived, remove it with my hand, then throw it into the center of the earth or up in the air as if I was tossing a ball. I then ask God to fill me up with light and love and imagine replacing the block's vacancies with beautiful white light from the sky. Sometimes I'd even put my hands in the sky and direct this energy's course to the top of my head. When I finished, I felt fully cleansed for the first time ever. I felt rejuvenated, clear, energized, and positive about my future. It felt like I'd fully detox or finally eliminated all the energetic toxins in my life. Encouraged by this turn of events, I began doing healings on friends and family members who felt off or had things that weren't going their way but couldn't explain why. When this happens, there's a good chance the sensation is related to stuck energy. Some had unexplained anxiety or depression. Others felt like they were going nowhere in their careers. And others had a traumatic past that they couldn't get over. Still others felt like they didn't have clarity on a topic or couldn't speak their truth. All of this led to feeling sad and heavy. And as I'd hoped, they all felt better after allowing me to heal them for anywhere between 20 minutes to one hour, depending on their baggage and what the universe would allow their bodies to release. News spread about my abilities and I began to quietly offer my skills to those in need, all via word of mouth from past clients. Because I was still working on my relationship and dating advice site, I did these healings for free. In fact, I gifted more than 10,000 sessions over a 10-year period. 
All of my referrals and repeat claims came to me through friends, family, and even strangers I'd meet at marketing and business seminars that I attended for work. My clients didn't always experience rainbows and butterflies when working with me. Sometimes their bodies physically purged the toxic energy that they needed to get rid of, which is fairly common among those who are heavily bogged down with stuck toxic energy. My business partner, Henry, for instance, had a lot of blockages in his stomach from feeling that he repeatedly gave away his power to others in business, relationships, all of it. Energetically, the stomach is considered the center of will and power and located in the third solar plexus chakra. Within an hour of removing Henry's blocks, he developed a stomach ache and threw up. His energetic release created a physical response. And though I felt bad, it was a nice confirmation that my healing worked. Similarly, I once worked on a woman's inability to communicate her feelings on a heated subject with her spouse, which energetically affects the throat or the fifth chakra. And when she left me, she had a sore throat for days until the healing fully settled. When I do a healing, I can absorb the other person's energy very easily. If I don't clear this energy, it can accumulate and cause me to be drained, have headaches, and generally feel terrible. I'll never forget the time I was in my parents' kitchen and my right ankle began to hurt for no apparent reason. Five minutes later, my father came in from the garage in a grumpy mood. Energetically, the right side of the body is said to harbor male energy, and the pain was a clue that I was picking up on my dad's attitude. Sure enough, on my drive home, the pain went away. I work with a photographer whose knee hurt from a history of sports injuries. I didn't do a healing on her, but during our shoot, my kneecap felt like I'd injured it. I thought I'd sprained my knee in the gym, but after I left, the pain went away. So if I ignore or resist these signals, other people's energies can become so intense that my body overheats. I have to take my socks off to release the trapped energy. The same thing can happen with my hands. Sometimes I soak my hands and feet in Epsom salt to detox them, and I always change my socks. At the end of a long day of serving others, I like to take a salt bath, turn off technology, connect with loved ones, play chess or take a try with my son, or say a prayer to release the energy I've worked with that day. Sometimes, simply being aware of it is enough to make the toxins dissipate. A spiritual what? I continued to conduct free healings on the West Coast for four years before moving to Sedona full-time. Soon after, I was called home to California to help support my dad, who was struggling because of his business failings and unable to socially adjust to his life in the States. While I was at my parents' house, the craziest thing started happening. Until that point, learning about healings and blockages had been my spiritual focus. And when I'd hear of something fun, I'd share it with my four sisters. Well, within a few days of spending time with them, they began to activate their own intuition and gifts just from being with me. This was a remarkable next step in my energetic development. My sister Pia was able to physically and energetically heal through touch. Claudine became a channeler. In fact, the first time she channeled an archangel who wanted to pass on timely business and relationship advice to me. My sister Lizelle had premonitions that came true and Elaine had ESP. Elaine and I liked to play a game where I'd hold up playing cards with the face turned away from her so she couldn't see it. I'd ask her to guess what it was, and she always got it right. Lizelle also dreamed that our father was behind bars. She didn't think much of it, but six months later, my father had a fight with my mother, who felt threatened and called 911. Dad was detained overnight and bailed out the next day. All of these activations happened in one weekend, but any time I was with my siblings, we'd experiment and entertain ourselves with our collective energy. What a wild and amusing turn of events for a Filipino family raised to hide from such things. When a friend banged her knuckle in a stairwell, causing it to sprain and bruise, 
Pia put her hands over the injured hand and immediately heard a cracking noise. The pain was gone, and the wound healed. This actually planted a seed in my mind that someday I might be able to do physical healings as well as energetic ones, but I wouldn't be able to master that gift for another six years. Though I recognized that I was somehow at the center of my sister's spiritual activations, it would be another five years until I'd really recognize that in addition to healing, I could identify and set other spiritual gifts and supernatural abilities into motion, be it as a healer, medium, psychic, and so on. I told my sisters I could turn on their gifts through healings. So clients began calling me a spiritual activator. I was as surprised as anyone that I could do this, but I believed that my abilities were designed to work hand in hand. Energy healings clear blocks and encourage divine energy to flow, which helps ignite spiritual gifts. New beginnings. I continued to do well as a consultant while doing healing on the side. I also got married, had a son named Brayden, but amicably separated from my first wife after five years. Our split drove me to visit Sedona yet again, this time to heal from deep sadness, anger, heaviness, and guilt that was burdening my heart. It was no secret that my heart chakra had become really congested. Not only did I suffer because of my divorce, but I still anguished over my dad and childhood. I was desperate to fall in love with myself again. As I detoxed my heart, let's just say I did a lot of crying, which was unusual for me since I grew up having been taught not to express much emotion. But once I was free of my heart's entanglement, the universe returned me to myself. I wrote songs again and went on dates with myself to the movies and dinner. I practiced self-love and it felt like coming home. Just four days after I purged my lonely, congested, and toxic heart, my current wife, Mandy, floated into my orbit. I was scrolling Facebook and noticed her soulful face looking back at me in the Friends You May Know bar. Yes, we met online. We had mutual friends, so I friended Mandy and watched a few of her videos about spirituality and wanting to change the world with love. I DM'd her and said, I love your message. But what are you selling? As it turned out, she was only making the videos to inspire others. But with my help, I had a feeling that we could spread her heartfelt message. Mandy and I messaged back and forth for a while, talking about everything from spirituality to channeling angels. Our friendship blossomed into dating, and we eventually moved to Sedona together and then to Dallas. Mandy was unlike anyone I'd ever met. She was a bright light of genuine integrity, a breath of fresh air. She was very purpose-driven and didn't care so much about making money as she did about making an impact on the world, which she felt she was born to do. Most of all, Mandy did it all with love. This appealed to me because my past had convinced me that leading with love wasn't the norm. I'll never forget how on one of our dates, I noticed that she was no longer walking beside me. When I turned around, Mandy was sitting on the bench with a homeless man, encouraging him to feel hope. And afterwards, she gave him food and money. Mandy has such a deep and unshakable love for others. Reinforced by her connection to God, I found it all very attractive and inspiring. After feeling let down by so many people in my life, Mandy renewed my faith in humanity and showed me that there are good people in the world. What's interesting is that shortly after meeting Mandy, my healing abilities shifted. For one, she taught me to infuse more love into my energy work. We also practiced how to channel on demand together. So I downloaded new and exciting messages about healing modalities from hidden archangels learn how to use sacred geometry in new ways and gathered fresh general wisdom and practical advice to help me and my clients. Finally, and this was a biggie, in a meditation, my spirit guides 
gave me permission to practice physical healings. Until I met Mandy, I was told that I wasn't ready to do this because I didn't have enough love in my heart. I had to let love flow through me and see the goodness in everyone to alleviate physical issues. Just being with Mandy inspired me to stop judging others and seeing them through society's eyes. I had to view them through God's eyes. To think that over the 10,000 energy sessions I did, none were physical healings because I didn't have enough love in my heart. It's rare to find a healer who possesses the right amount of unconditional love to restore health to a stranger. Mandy launched her company, Authentic Living, which mostly focused on teaching others how to raise their vibration and manifest their greatest desires a few months after meeting me. She taught them how to move from abuse to happiness, from nine to five jobs to purpose work. I help her from behind the scenes, offering strategy and marketing assistance. We were such great partners in life and in the pursuit of our purpose work that Mandy and I got married, gained custody of my son, Brayden, and began building a life together. But it wasn't until Mandy was pregnant with our son Zion two years later that I decided to fully step into my healing business and become more invested in the company. I closed the marketing and consulting business that I'd launched to solely focus on teaching clients to become energy healers, activate their gifts, and pursue their purpose work. When Mandy was pregnant with Zion, I thought a lot about what it meant to be a father. I wanted to be the best version of myself. So my children became my why. I knew that I needed to shine my light full time and be seen, regardless of judgment for my gifts, so that my sons would have a better life. Healing was such an intimate part of me. And choosing to do it full time definitely made me feel vulnerable. But I worked through it because I didn't want my children to have a father who was afraid to be himself. At the heart of this was a worry that I'd repeat my own father's controlling, irrational, insecure, and overbearing tendencies. I didn't want to walk that familiar path. His suffering and unhappiness affected my sisters and me very deeply. I knew that I had to be a better role model for my family. I had to be more so my kids would be more. Spreading the Geo Love about a year into supporting Authentic Living from a marketing and business angle, I did my first official workshop, teaching clients how to become healers, activate their gifts, and discover their purpose work. I believed so much in universal timing because I put the finishing touches on a bona fide program around the same time Mandy was pregnant. I felt ready to out myself as a healer and live that life fully. I launched GeoLove Healing with the intention of giving as many people as possible the tools to master and clear their energy so they could feel centered and happy. I began with an initial self-paced 30-day program, and as my audience grew and went on to become energy healers with incredible stories of their own, I decided to offer certification programs. First, there's Geo One, which teaches people how to become healers feel and remove energy in themselves and others and heal others in person or remotely. Next comes Geo 2, which is a second level that teaches you how to become a healer in group settings. Plus, learn more about your gifts, how to activate people's gifts, and how to use a healing modality called rainbow energy to clear physical conditions. Finally, there's Geo 3, an advanced energy course that explores soul traveling, generational and karmic healing, advanced techniques for severe physical conditions, how to channel and how to play with time when conducting a healing. Collectively, all the programs are called Soul University. The universe didn't give me access to sacred tools until my vibration matched that of the information I was meant to share. I had to be ready for it or else I might misuse it. When creating programs, I was always eager to learn the next tool and waiting for it reminded me of waiting for the next season of my favorite TV show as a kid. I had to develop a lot of patience. Case in point, 
The lessons in this book's detox program took me nearly 10 years to learn and perfect. Today, I lead sold-out events and teach packed online sessions to clients all over the world. Our last event had 15,000 souls who paid to learn how to raise their vibration and live beautiful lives. And the next one we have planned should have 30,000 individuals registered. I'm so excited to bring you my 15-day energy detox program. It's the culmination of everything I've studied, channeled, learned, taught, and practiced, and has the power to transform your life. Clearing energy is integral to growth so that you can awaken your gifts from an energetically clean slate and then pursue your purpose work for the highest good of all. A solid energetic detox is necessary no matter where you are in your spiritual growth process. Some of the techniques like grounding and cutting cords are inspired by what Crystal and Nick taught me. I channel a lot of information too, like how to use sacred geometry and activate your and others' spiritual gifts. Collectively, this simple, fun program will help you be and do your best. Like so many who've detoxed before you, you will glow from the inside out. Let's get detoxing. In the coming chapters, I will help you detox your energy to remove the cumulative negative effects of blocked energy on your physical, emotional, spiritual, and energetic bodies. Once you've eliminated the toxins that have built up in your auric field, you'll be poised to live your best life. Much like food or juice cleanse that jumpstarts a healthy eating plan or purges your system of harmful toxins, you will cleanse your energetic body to activate your gifts and purpose work. This program will give you total peace, purpose, and clarity whenever you feel emotionally, physically, energetically, or spiritually bogged down. You'll learn to cleanse yourself from energetic blocks that slow down, dampen, or altogether stop your ability to thrive. I can't wait for you to harness the incredible energy that allows you to pursue all that you desire.